It is always striking to see how few Bloomsbury Group documentaries exist. Epitomizing the attitude of the progressive liberal, confused, degenerate, often mentally ill and blasé, the Bloomsbury Group, or SET, established an attitude that progressives have emulated for almost 100 years. The Bloomsbury Group, with their bored hedonism, could often fall back on family money or houses, wealthy nobility, or a country not supporting millions of illegals through welfare. So their decisions are much harder to replicate now than in 1910 England. Mary Barnes Hutchinson, born in 1889, was a fascinating and complex woman and part of the Bloomsbury Group, to whom the British artist Henry Tonks once said, what an unusual power you have. You are no ordinary person. A sentiment that was echoed by many, though certainly not all, of her contemporaries. Artwork of her uh, sports heart-shaped leaves or the color red, indicating her love and romance in her social groups. Although she was a consistent figure in writer T.S. Eliot's life from 1916 until his death, their remarkable relationship has not been explored to any great extent. This video will shed some light on the woman herself and on that relationship as well as other relationships in her life. Hutchinson was born in India in March 1889 to Sir Hugh Barnes and Winifred Strachey Barnes. She was a half-cousin to Lytton Strachey, who was a degenerate, and you can learn more about him on this channel. In photographs, the family in India was accompanied by servants and appears to be musical, posing with guitars. After Mary's mother's death, she and her brother were raised in Florence, Italy by her maternal grandparents with lives that were privileged, cultured, and cosmopolitan. She appears to have learned French around this time. After these beloved grandparents died, the children attended boarding schools in England. In 1909, at the age of 20, she moved to London, and in 1910 married the eminent liberal barrister St. John Hutchinson, a marriage that lasted until his death in 1942, despite her many affairs. Hutchinson was five years her senior. Once married, they lived in London and raised two children, Jeremy Baron Hutchinson, who died at the age of 102 after marrying a British actress, and Barbara Judith, who married Victor Rothschild, the third Baron Rothschild. You can learn more about the Rothschilds and their relationship with American publisher William Randolph Hearst on this channel. A wealthy socialite and a member of the Beau Monde, she was famous for her elegant soirees at their homes Eleanor House and River House, and for her stylish fashion sense, a source both of admiration and of envy. Writer Virginia Woolf, for example, often commented admiringly on Mary's clothing, describing in her diary in January 1923 Hutchinson's lemon-colored trousers with green ribbons. In a letter to Quentin Bell in July 1933, she wrote, Mary is to me ravishing in chalk white with a yellow turban, but couldn't resist adding that she looked like an Arab horse. As David Bradshaw notes, Virginia Woolf regarded Mary as a paragon of style, asking her in 1924 to write a book on fashion for the Hogarth Press and their handmade books. That the book never materialized was a source of some annoyance to Virginia. Mary's style in yellow and green would be immortalized by Virginia Woolf's sister, Vanessa Bell, who painted Mary in yellow. In 1914, Hutchinson began a 12-year affair with the art critic Clive Bell, eight years her senior and Vanessa Bell's husband. Through him, she was included in the activities of the Bloomsbury Group. However, she was always considered a bit of an outsider and was often the subject of jealousy, spite, and gossip. This is common in communistic circles, as much of communistic philosophy is based upon sheer jealousy. You have this and I want it. However, the Bloomsbury group attempted to downplay their jealousy as being upper crust, confusing themselves further. 
With the hope of winning their acceptance of her, Clive Bell praised her extravagantly, which aggravated them instead. According to Quentin Bell, Clive insisted that they should recognize in her the most infinitely subtle and civilized being in their society, arguing in a letter to Harold Nicholson, that delicious person was the nearest approach we can hope to see, which would be the Milliman de Nogier, a reference to Congreve's The Way of the World, which had recently been performed in London. Virginia Woolf famously and somewhat spitefully referred to the pair as parakeets. But members of the Bloomsbury group would then try to rein in their passion, and so drove themselves half mad by attempting to tap down natural human feelings regarding marriage and adultery. As with most of the members of the Bloomsbury group, male or female, Hutchinson was flirtatious and had various sexual liaisons with both men and women, in addition to her long-term and openly acknowledged affair with Clive Bell. These included liaisons with Vida Sackville-West, Peter Morris, a young American artist living in London in 1927, and the Frenchman Georges Duthuit, the son-in-law of the artist Matisse. Mary may also have had an affair with Virginia Woolf, as indicated by some of their letters to each other in the 1920s and 1930s with erotic overtones. It was, as at least as Nicholas Murray notes, a complicated relationship, but I seriously doubt it was sexual and more simply competitive. Woolf disliked Hutchinson, whether she admitted it or not, for sleeping with her sister's husband. Further, Hutchinson had a secret and steamy relationship with Aldous and Maria Huxley. According to Murray in his biography of Huxley, beginning in late 1922 or early 1923, Huxley and Hutchinson began an affair, which soon evolved into a menage a trois with Maria. Murray indicates that from the beginning, Mary's interest in Huxley was a means to his wife, Maria. Maria Nyes, Huxley's wife, grew up largely alone in Belgium and so adopted unhealthy attitudes towards older women out of feelings of abandonment. One of her relatives was Lady Adeline Morel, and when Maria stayed with Morel, one of the most generous Bloomsbury Group hostesses, Maria developed a sexual infatuation with her. Instead of addressing this head on, the family encouraged Maria to get married, and she did to Aldous Huxley in 1919. They soon had a son, Matthew, and Maria was writing lesbian love letters again. In June 1925, Maria wrote to Mary, with a hint of jealousy at the end, Never have I seen you more lovely. Mary and I remember with poignant tenderness your new beauty with closed eyes during last night. Goodbye, my precious Mary. Be happy and wild and gay and don't forget how I kissed you. Why don't you write to me? Does Aldous take up all your thoughts? And in August 1925, she wrote, Aldous has just come into my bed and he smelt so strongly of you that it made me giddy. Both the Huxleys seem to have existed in a permanent state of sexual desire for Mary throughout their extended voyage to India, Italy, Southeast Asia, and the United States from September 1925 to June 1926 while their son remained in boarding school, with the correspondence among all three frank, open, and passionate. This complex and weird relationship continued until the end of the decade. You would think Hutchinson would have better things to do than run off to Italy to spend time with this couple, like raise her two children, but apparently she didn't. She was described as a tease, and so perhaps didn't want to do much with Huxley after all, who had several marriage affairs during his first marriage and told his wife all about them in detail. Another facet of Hutchinson was her in-depth knowledge of and devotion to literature and the arts, especially those of France. And she was particularly passionate about Wagner's operas, the Ballet Russe, and Dante. Interests which T.S. Eliot shared and which thus would have made her appealing to him when he appeared on the scene. In her unpublished memoir of Eliot, she noted that he usually carried a copy of either Dante or Virgil in his pocket. 
She was a patron of the arts and a friend to numerous artists, writers, and intellectuals, including the novelist George Moore, the choreographer and lead dancer for the Ballet Russe, Leonid Messine, and the artist Henri Matisse. On the walls of her home were paintings by Matisse, Durain, Dufy, and Lawrenson, painters whom Elliot also admired. In January 1921, for example, he purchased a Dufy painting for his wife Vivian on a trip to Paris. Matisse sketched Hutchinson in charcoal, despite or maybe because of her affairs with his son-in-law, and Hutchinson's husband purchased the sketch from Matisse for £8,000. The cuckoldry is really remarkable. The family held onto the sketch but put it up for auction where it fetched more than £3 million in 2018. Hutchinson was the subject of a number of works of art. Henry Tonks painted a watercolor portrait of her and her baby daughter in 1912 and a pastel of her in a red jacket in 1913, which was displayed in the new art club exhibition. In 1915, Vanessa Bell, Clive's wife, painted a very unflattering portrait of her, obviously as a form of revenge for her affair with her husband, describing it as perfectly hideous and yet quite recognizable. In the early 1930s, the Russian artist Boris Anrep used her as his model for a Arato, the, music, the muse of lyric poetry, in his mosaic The Awakening of the Muses, which is in the entrance hall of London's National Gallery. The mosaic also includes Clive Bell as Bacchus, at whose feet Hutchinson sits, and Osbert Sitwell as Apollo, with the nine muses surrounding them, including Virginia Woolf as Cleo, the muse of history, the Russian ballerina Lydia Labokova as Terpsichore, the muse of dance, and even Greta Garbo as Mel Panuimin, the muse of tragedy. T.S. Eliot appears nearby in a set of 15 mosaics in the North Vestibule depicting the modern virtues, which was completed later in 1952. In virtue number eight, entitled Leisure, he reclines on a balustrade in front of Loch Ness while contemplating Einstein's theory of relativity. Apparently not knowing of his inclusion beforehand, Eliot wrote to the artist and rep in November 1952 that he was most flattered and interested to hear that I am included in your mosaic. So it's possible Mary didn't know she was included either. In 1936, Matisse did two drawings of Mary in Paris and for many years afterwards sent her a lily on her birthday. She also was the inspiration for literary works, serving as a model for Virginia Woolf's leading characters in Mrs. Dalloway, The Waves, and The Years, but of course, Woolf used many different sources for the inspiration for those characters. Later in her life, Mary was among the early champions of Samuel Beckett, was a supporter of the Royal Shakespeare Company, and in 1959, at the age of 70, helped launch the short-lived but influential arts magazine X, which featured contemporary painters, poets, and novelists. Her son would take on her love of theater, marrying actress Peggy Ashcroft in 1940 and having several children. Yet another compelling aspect of Hutchinson was her wit and intellect. Her brother argued it would be difficult to talk above her head. Her short stories appeared in impressive journals and magazines from The Egoist in 1917 to London Magazine in 1956. In the 1920s, she was a regular contributor to Vogue and The Nation and The Athenaeum with the pen name of Polly Flinders. It is not known whether these pieces inspired the Polly Flinders dresses of the 1950s and 1960s, which originated in Cincinnati, Ohio. In 1927, the Hogarth Press published a collection of 13 of her articles and six of her short stories entitled Fugitive Pieces. The stories focus on the limitations that social cues and expectations place on people in general, but on women in particular, such as the opening story entitled Tea. While the articles cover such varied topics as the French artist Marie Laurenson, the Ballet Russe, Parisian fashions, the London scene, and feminist issues. It is possible that her writing on feminism made Virginia very jealous, who was, of course, one of the leading feminist writers. Interspersed in both the articles and the stories is a wide range of allusions to and quotations from writers such as Sappho, Ovid, Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Baudelaire, and Proust, as well as passages in French suggesting that she assumed a readership as broadly cultured and educated as herself. 
She also wrote an introduction to Joseph Hone's 1939 biography of the artist Tonks, as well as unpublished biographical sketches of Elliot, Virginia Woolf, Aldous Huxley, and others, which are held in the Harry Ransom Humanities Research Center at the University of Texas at Austin, and which should probably be published to get an interesting view of the Bloomsbury Group. With her charm, self-confidence, her position in London society, her intelligence, and many of the same interests that T.S. Eliot himself had, it is easy to see why she held great appeal for him and managed to have a lifelong relationship with him. Eliot and Hutchinson met, met in the summer of 1916 through Clive Bell and Bertrand Russell, beginning a lifelong relationship. The Hutchinsons and the Elliots socialized. As Hutchinson was a politician, his frequent contact with these degenerates influenced his liberal politics, and he was eventually defeated by a conservative. They dined at each other's homes, and Hutchinson often invited them to her famous parties, thus providing the Elliots with an entry into the intellectual and artistic society of London from Elliot's Native America. Elliot, like Huxley, had worked for the government for a brief time, and this bureaucratic career was looked down upon by the Bloomsbury Group, and so additional effort would be required for his entry. Concerning an invitation to a party at River House in June 1923, Elliot sent his regards to Mary in witty verse, explaining that he was very busy in French, and that some of the guests were less than appealing to him, including... Mary herself. He described Mrs. H, though rich, a dreary kind of bitch. He added that he was attracted by Roger Fry and by the magnetic, sympathetic, pathetic, aesthetic quality of your own personality. After signing his name T.S.E., he noted that Vivian would have made the party brighter. It's a pity you didn't invite her, but she wouldn't have come if you had, without revealing why Mary had not invited his wife nor why she wouldn't have come. On the envelope, he wrote Hutchinson's address in Hammersmith in rhyme in the neoclassical style of Alexander Pope and Arthur Rimbaud, and the British Postal Office delivered it. Take postman, take your little skiff, and ply upstream to Hammersmith, and rest your oar, nay, but you shall, by River House at Upper Mall. This letter, when all said and done, is meant for Mrs. Hutchinson. Furthermore, the two couples went together to various art events, such as performances of the Ballet Russe. In May 1919, the Elliots, the Hutchinsons, and Bridget Patmore saw Carnival, the Firebird, and the Good Humored Ladies. In July 1919, the Elliots and the Sitwells went to the premiere of the Three Cornered Hat, and the following night, Elliot went alone with the Hutchinsons to see it again, and this may have jump started his theatric career. You can also learn more about Edith Sitwell in her videos on this channel. Hutchinson was a close friend and confidant of both Vivian and Elliot. This was a theme in her life where she befriended both husband and wife in couples and often seemed more interested in the wife. The two women often corresponded and spent time together both in London and Bosham, where the Elliots rented a summer cottage, going on picnics, boating, and talking. Vivian adored Hutchinson and depended on her greatly as one of her few real friends, often complaining about her husband and later sharing confidences as their marriage became more and more strained. In a letter from July 1919, for example, she complained, Tom is impossible, full of nerves, very morbid and grumpy going so far as to say, I wish you had him, and closing with, you are all that I admire. Of course, in the Elliot Vivian divorce, Vivian was painted very badly and accused of having various mental illnesses. Hutchinson played a similar role for Elliot, and we can only imagine what a tightrope she had to walk in this regard as she received sensitive commentary from both parties. D.H. Lawrence's description of Hutchinson is as one of the few women left on earth who really listen to a man, no men do, and it's quite stimulating. This may explain why the typically reserved Elliot was willing to reveal to her intimate and sensitive issues in his life. From the late teens, through the agonizing problems associated with the Elliot's legal separation in the early 1930s and beyond, Elliot wrote her frankly about Vivian's numerous illnesses and his marital difficulties, and so the letters are an important resource in how mental illness was viewed at the time. Concerning Vivian's refusal to accept their separation, he asked Hutchinson in a letter from September 1933 to try to convince Vivian that it would not be changed, and confided that he could not return to a marriage to which he had already given the best years of his life. 
In a letter from January 1934 on New Year's Day, he wrote that Vivian was still begging him to return and he felt as if he were suspended in a void. He would convert to Catholicism and leave the mentally ill Vivian behind as early as 1927. However, there was also an element of mutual attraction and flirtation between Elliot and Mary in their relationship from 1917 to 1924, when Mary became heavily involved with the Huxleys. When she did, Virginia Woolf and her consistent husband to play hard to get. It is seen in some of Elliot's letters to Hutchinson and substantiated by several third parties and is acknowledged in her biographical sketch in the 2009 revised edition of the first volume of the letters of T.S. Elliot, which notes she was for a time in the late 1910s a very intimate friend of his. But this period extended from the late 1910s into the early 1920s. Of the 26 letters, postcards, and telegrams to her omitted from the first edition but added to the revised edition, many concern this facet of their relationship. In a letter from March 1919, Elliot invited her to come dancing at a place near Baker Street, where they teach new dances and steps which I don't know and want to learn, after which they could have dinner, closing with I think it would be rather fun, do come. And so this was a sort of date. Whether Vivian, with whom Hutchinson was having lunch that day, was included is not clear. In a very long letter from July 1919, months later, he thanked her for her charming letter, which he told her arrived just a few hours after he had mailed one to her, adding, I am so pleased, I mean something more important than feeling flattered. After a lengthy discussion of culture and intelligence, he wrote, I want to understand you and all the background and tradition of you. I shall try to be frank because the attempt is so very much worthwhile with you in september 1920 he wrote please do not dread the winter in london why should you it might be so nice i can think of ways in which it might be the last sentence intriguingly ambiguous in november 1921 this letter did not appear in the first edition of the letters of t.s Eliot, but was added to the revised edition he wrote this is a farewell note to tell you how much i enjoyed seeing you yesterday it gave me great pleasure and also to thank you again for your sweet and beautiful present to happiness tom Apparently, they met while Elliot was in London briefly after returning from Margate and before departing for France. A telegram of August 1923 asked, If alone, can you picnic Sunday, meet 3.30 at the Black Boy Inn, Fishburn, reply Fishburn. While another from September 1923 read, Would you like to picnic Itchenor Ferry, 7 o'clock, bringing own food. On New Year's Day, 1924, he wrote to thank her for two Christmas presents, a lovely handkerchief, which is very gay and buckish, and a portrait of herself, which he described as a portrait of a lady resembling a lady of my acquaintance. This latter has merits of its own of an austere kind, but they are in existence in formal views made on a picnic with a small camera, which have more of the warmth of humankind. But I hope in a week or two to see the original. Do these letters indicate a romantic affair? The third party that substantiates this aspect of their relationship was a very jealous Clive Bell. In January 1917, when Elliot and Hutchinson were rehearsing for a play by Lytton Strachey, he wrote accusingly to Hutchinson that you will be flirting with Elliot, while she wrote to Strachey the next day that she wondered whether she was ready to give Mr. Elliot a prolonged kiss. By way of reminder, Lytton and her were distant relatives. In a letter from 1917, Bell je jealously speculated, Oh, Mr. Elliot has come to call after his dinner party, and you are getting on very well, talking about his verses. Get him to show you how the footman sat on the dining room table while the s with the second housemaid on his deep knees, which is pretty vulgar. In September 1917, Bell wondered what this great secret attraction in Mr. T.S.E. beyond his boyo and his plus boyo must be and three days later referred to her wicked, sidelong glances at Mr. T.S.E. One has to remember, Bell was married. Others noticed the flirtation as well. Catherine Mansfield, for example, noted wittily that Hutchinson had an eye on Robert Graves and an eyebrow on Elliot at a party at Hutchinson's home of River House in June 1917. The aspect of their relationship seems to have ended as a result of Hutchinson's secret affair with Aldous and Maria Huxley, but somehow the other facets of their friendship, including the literary component, survived and continued for 40 years. 
Hutchinson often lent Elliot aid and support. She tried to help him in his quest to get a commission with the United States Navy in 1918, lent him books by Flaubert when he was ill, arranged in June 1922 for him to dine with the choreographer and dancer Messine, who he must much admired, and in June 1928 brought him cigarettes, the only kind he could smoke, and responded in his pleas for aid in his search for houses on various occasions. And so we see in Mary Hutchinson this attraction to people who were outsiders. Elliot, of course, was an American who had traveled to England, and she was also very attractive to Aldous Huxley's wife, who was an outsider traveling from Belgium to England. It may be that these individuals could bond with Mary over her childhood in India and her artistic life. What is most remarkable about the long association of Eliot and Hutchinson is their literary bond, which had two elements. It is different from Mary's bond to Aldous Huxley, which seems purely sexual and relied more on his wife. Um, and Huxley also relied on his wife instead of an outside party for typing and other aspects of his work. Eliot clearly admired some of Hutchinson's writing, publishing her short story War in the December 1917 issue of The Egoist, of which he had recently become assistant editor. After reading her manuscript, he wrote to her that he enjoyed it very much and found it very well written. When advising her that it would be published in the journal, he noted, I am looking forward to discussing it with you in detail. Although the story's title implies that it is about World War I, an implication retained when it was retitled Near the Barracks and Fugitive Pieces, in fact, it is a psychological study of the internal war, taking place in a 24-year-old Jane, who is very similar in many ways to Hutchinson herself, a married woman living in London during the war who believes that she is truly in love for the first time ever with a Frenchman named Ginever, based to some extent on Clive Bell. However, after Jane's sophisticated Parisian friend Sabine convinced her that it is an illusion and that he is well known for his illicit liaisons, Jane breaks it off with him immediately. So it appears that the fictional Hutchinson was more moral than her real self. Hutchinson served as a trusted literary advisor to Eliot beginning in 1917. Would Eliot's career have been the same without Hutchinson? At an Easter gathering at Adeline Morell's Garsington Manor that year, Mary was among the guests who heard Catherine Mansfield read aloud the title poem from Prufrock and other observations. Soon after the book appeared in print in June, Hutchinson wrote to Eliot to compliment him, and in reply he noted, it is good of you to speak well of Prufrock. I fear it will simply appear a shelf to most of my friends. They are growing tired of waiting for something better from we, from me. Subsequently, Eliot often sought her opinions about this work, obviously respecting her intellect and trusting her judgment. In July 1919, he sent her a copy of Gerontian, which she had asked to see out of politeness, I dare say, requesting that she not show it to anyone because he is not at all finally satisfied with it. He asked, let me have your candid opinion upon it and also please on Blystein in Art and Letters, adding that Blystein, like Sweeney among the Nightingales, is meant to be very serious and Hippopotamus and Webster aren't. He then added, I can show you the thing I enclose, Gerontian, how I have borrowed from half a dozen sources as boldly as Shakespeare borrowed from North, but I am as traditionalist as a Chinaman or a Yankee. Clearly, he not only valued Mary's opinion on these two poems, but also wanted her to understand his intentions and methods so she could guide him better. In September 1921, Eliot consulted her about the feasibility of launching a new quarterly, which became the Criterion. Soliciting her views as a member of the intellectual and literary community, which would be potential sus subscribers. He asked, do you think candidly that a journal the size of art and letters or a might more in it is possible or worthwhile? These are the questions. Are there enough good contributors? Are there enough possible subscribers? Cost. Whether I am competent and have time enough. He also made it clear that she was among a very small number of people whose opinions he had sought. I have only discussed this with two or three people for the sake of technical information which they have, so please keep it to yourself until I let you know it may be revealed, indicating his trust in her ability to keep it secret. He ended by asking when he might see her again. Is there any chance of you coming up 
to London before October and could we meet? Do you know we have not met since April? This level of comfort and trust as regards his work continued. In June 1922, Virginia Woolf recorded in her diary her puzzled but positive response to Eliot's reading aloud part of The Wasteland. He sang it and chanted it and rhymed it. It has great beauty and force of phrase, symmetry, and tensity. What connects it together, I'm not so sure. But he read till he had to rush away on business, and discussion thus was curtailed. One was left, however, with some strong emotion. The Wasteland, it is called. She then adds that Mary Hutchinson, who has heard it more quietly, interprets it to be Tom's autobiography, a melancholy one. Wolf would abbreviate Mary Hutchinson in her diary as Mary Hutch. Clearly, Eliot must have read this poem to Hutchinson privately on an earlier occasion when she had formed a most perceptive interpretation. In the summer of 1927, Hutchinson, the Wolfs, and McKnight Cowfer were called upon to render an opinion of an early draft of Ash Wednesday. Leonard Wolf recounted that Eliot, wishing them to criticize seriously what he had just written, sent each a typescript to read. Then they gathered one evening after dinner at his house to render their opinions. According to Leonard, we all sat solemnly on chairs around the room and Tom began by reading the poem aloud in that curious monotonous sing-song in which all poets from Homer downwards have recited their poetry. Then each in turn was called upon to criticize. The order was, I think, Mary I. Virginia Cowfer. It was rather like an examination, not of the examinee, but of the examiners, and Mary Cowfer and I didn't do too well. In fact, Tom dismissed rather severely some of the things that some of us said. Virginia passed with flying colors. In this case, Hutchinson was one of a very select group whose opinions Eliot sought on his new poetic endeavor, even though he was not completely pleased with their views. In letters of January 1936 and October 1941, he described to Hutchinson his feelings about Burnt Norton and Little Gidding. In the former, he confided that even though he was dissatisfied with the last four lines, he felt that Burnt Norton would make a good concluding poem for his volume of collected poetry, clearly not yet having conceived of writing the three additional poems that make up four quartets. In the latter, he enclosed a, co a copy of Little Gidding with the hope that she would like it, noting that because of World War II, he felt m it more important than ever that his poetry be good. Finally, in the late 40s and early 50s, he commented on productions of his plays. In the letter of August 1949, he told Mary of some amusing incorrect titles for the cocktail party that had been printed in two reviews, The Cocktail Bar in the Telegraph and Cocktail Time in the Herald Tribune, and said that he was very pleased to have Alec Guinness playing the role of the unidentified guest, perhaps due to Guinness's resemblance to the late Gerald de Maurier. In a letter from September 1949, Elliot wrote that the cast and acting were superb, in October 1953, he urged her to see The Confidential Clerk, one of his plays, wondering if she would like it and admitting that he found its success disconcerting. Other letters of this later period reveal that Eliot continued to rely on Hutchinson as a trusted confidant. We don't have all of the Hutchinson letters, and so we don't know whether Eliot ever made Hutchinson an offer of marriage after his separation from Vivian or whether it was considered. In October 1941, Eliot described moving from family to family with no home of his own, a sad revelation of his rootlessness and loneliness. In September 1949, Eliot mentioned that he had a new secretary named Miss Fletcher and eight years later sent her their 1957 wedding announcement. After their marriage, he wrote her two more letters. In October 1961, he explained his difficulty in comprehending co contemporary modern poets, noting that while he was accused of being obscure in his time, he found current poets very obscure. The last letter in the collection is dated September 1964, just three months before his death. Hutchinson outlived him by 12 years, dying in 1977 at the age of 88. Eliot's remarkable and complex relationship with this intriguing and extraordinary woman endured nearly 50 years. It is this relationship that we rely upon to get a full view of Mary over the decades. 
based for the most part on shared literary interests, on an appreciation of the other's knowledge of and devotion to a whole range of the arts, on the keen intellectual capacities and wit of each, on a mutual attraction of some year's duration, and on friendship so deep and trusting that they confided their innermost feelings to each other, this relationship gives us numerous insights into both Eliot and Hutchinson. We discover in her a Renaissance woman who had many talents, intelligence, charm, and liberal sexual attitudes. Eliot's letters to her are some of his most revealing, giving us glimpses into his personal life and his very human and vulnerable aspects, in addition to his well-known literary acumen and serious side. They also reveal a woman who has been largely ignored, maybe due to her periphery on the Bloomsbury group, but also due to a lack of scholarship. We also see Eliot's perhaps surprising reliance on Mary as a sounding board for various literary undertakings that maybe would not have been completed without her, and his appreciation of her as a writer. Unfortunately, Mary's letters to Eliot, which would have provided additional insights, apparently have not survived. Many of her published books are also out of print, and so it's difficult to determine her legitimate view. However, her role as an important and enduring, if somewhat obscure figure in Eliot's life and the life of much of the Bloomsbury group is without question.